I'm talking about the remarkable properties of DLCO from a certain view, and you see this from my conflicts of interest. So I've been working in the field of pulmonary vasculature about pulmonary hypertension. So this may be a little bit focus uh, my interests uh, in this direction, but I hope it's interesting for, for everybody. So there is uh, a fascination about the DLCO. If you, for example, look at this study, uh, looking at patients, uh, not patients, but uh, runners from the Boston Marathon. And the qualifiers with times here between 140 minutes and 210 minutes for the marathon um, and all the others were measured with the DLCO. And in the 10 qualifiers, you see a very nice correlation between the DLCO and the running time. So if you want to know if you can win the Boston Marathon, do the DLCO first. So this tells you something about the power output capability of your lung, so the horsepowers of your lung in the, in the very best. So that's fascinating. The other thing which I found fascinating is this study, which Helgo just uh, showed you, it's uh, uh, about the Swiss study where they operated on 33 patients with lung uh, volume su su reduction surgery. The interesting point was that all these patients had a, a DLCO below 20% of normal before the operation. And um, two remarkable results. First, the 90-day survival was 100%, so they are excellent surgeons, surgeons in Zurich. And the second point, the DLCO increased from 17 to 28 percent of normal. So it is possible that the DLCO also increases if the structural changes which are in the lung are made better by a good operation. So the next fascinating point. We have a lot of data uh, on DLCO measurements over many years with many different devices. Here, uh, 12,660 have been published in two, uh, uh, 2017 as GLI reference values. And if you look then on uh, the uh, effect of age, you see with increasing age, the DLCO goes down. With different devices, you so see this, however, it is difficult to interpret these data because there are so many patients over so many years with so many different devices that I prefer to look at a newer publication from a single center with healthy subjects who were very well selected to be really healthy and um, they had all the same device and when you now look on the DLCO measurements in the young adults, males, about 40, 45 um, ml per minute per tour, as compared to the old healthy adults here, 95 years of age, you find less than 15. So you see that the age plays a very, very big role for the DLCO result. And um, you see that uh, when they fitted their curves, the age occurred two times, one as a linear variable and the second as a squared variable. So that's the red line here. You see the downhill. Um, and this is also true in the females, but not so steep. Females are always better. Uh, um, however, what we learn from that is that you can say the DLCO is kind of um, a measure of the life expectancy. The life expectancy with a high DLCO is high because the people are young and it's low because the people are lo uh, old. So you have an indirect measure of the lung age of a subject. And I think this is very important and will have uh, also an impact on uh, patients with diseases which, uh, who have been measured. I'll come to this. Now you could argue that's not a reliable measure because it depends very much on the cardiac output. And the cardiac output goes up and down depending on the mood and things. However, there was a, a very nice study uh, by 
by uh, Zaworski, in, uh, published in 2004, where they measured the DLCO in subjects at rest at 40% peak VO2, and 75% and 90% peak VO2. And you see how the heart rate goes up very much, up to 180. The VO2 goes up very much, and the DLCO is nearly constant. It just increases a little bit. So the cardiac output would increase by a factor of five, but the uh, DLCO just by about 50%, less than 50%. So this means it's not much dependent on the cardiac output changes. It's, import it's, it's dependent on other uh, properties of the lung. For example, the architecture of the lung vessels. This is a very important point. As you can see in a, in a, in a difficult uh, population, there was a study from Japan where they compared patients with an idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension with those ones who had a pulmonary venous occlusive disease. So both diseases have a very high pulmonary pressure and resistance and a, a low uh, pulmonary blood flow. So no differences between the two groups. And this would be uh, the HRCT of an IPH patient and this of a pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis and this of a PVOD. What you see in the, in the uh, perfusion scans is that the patients who have PVOD have no homogeneous blood flow. They have patchy blood flow patterns in their lungs. And these patchy blood flow patterns have an impact then on the, P, uh, on the DLCO. So the factors which were associated with PVOD as compared to IPH were the male gender, a low uh, six-minute walk distance, low saturation during exercise, and a low DLCO below 34% of normal. So this means it makes a difference if the blood flow is homogeneous or patchy, if the very small vessels are uh, or how they are affected. And um, another study uh, which I found important is um, the, the question, how can we use the DLCO in patients with an emphysema? And the most important notion here is when we look on those patients who have emphysema on CT, most of these patients have also a, a lowered diffusion capacity and the test is even better than the FEV, uh, uh, um, FEV1 uh, measurement. So we can say if a subject has a normal DLCO, this excludes structural lung disease inclusive, uh, inclusive um, the emphysema. We made um, an observation in our uh, group which is a, um, a research institute in combination with a clinical institute, we received end-stage lungs from COPD patients for lung transplantation. And we had pre-transplant clinical data to compare with. And what we looked for was a certain protein which uh, is contained in the pulmonary vessels, which is P22-FOX. This is a protein which belongs to the NADPH oxidase and is an oxygen sensor mechanism of the lung, which is very important for the matching of, uh, of uh, blood flow to the ventilation. And when, if you look on this, we see here on the uh, x-axis increasing levels of the P22 FOX, so more oxygen sensing capacity in a patient, and with that, we see that the oxygenation index goes up. So they match better if they have the P22 FOX. But if they have the P22 FOX, they also have higher pulmonary artery pressure because the matching is a constrictive mechanism. So the low ventilated areas are constricting, and if this happens, then the pulmonary pressure goes up. Now comes the interesting point. When we now look on the expression of the P22 FOX versus the DLCO, we see with increasing 
capacity to vasoconstrict, the patients have lower DLCO. So this means in COPD patients, the DLCO is much more a measure of the vasculature and the, uh, the constriction in the vessels than of anything else. So that's my interpretation. We can discuss that. <laughs> now I'm uh, talking about the prognostic impact. I've already talked about the prognostic impact in healthy subjects. Now I'm going to patients with interstitial lung disease. And he, we, here we had the first uh, observations uh, by Hamada about 20 years ago from Japan again. They found that in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, the DLCO and the mean pulmonary artery pressure were independent predictors of survival. And the same was found in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Here, the DLCO was independent on the uh, high resolution CT uh, patterns, which were also uh, predictors. And uh, another study uh, showed also in um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis that the DLCO. Uh, together with the BAL and the radiologic pattern were predictors of survival. So that's very clear. Here the DLCO plays a big role. But even in those ones who have possible UIP pattern, so these are patients, mixed patients, who are um, uh, not clear uh, comparing, uh, concerning their diagnosis and sometimes just have a little bit of changes within their lungs. Also here, uh, it was shown that the DLCO predicted the survival. In rheumatoid arthritis interstitial lung disease, this is uh, not so rare at all. There is a, a very nice study from China. 300 such patients, uh, 266 were included. They found that the DLCO was even a predictor of the development of interstitial lung disease and uh, together with the CCP antibodies. But we have even more. So if we look on uh, patients with chronic heart failure, and this uh, was a study which looked on 214 such patients of different origin, they found that the DLCO was among the most important factors determining the prognosis of these patients. So this is a better DLCO and a worse DLCO. So this is heart failure. It has not much to do with the lung, but still we see this. And this, this is the systemic aspect of that measure. The same is true in HEFPEF. So these are patients who have kind of a heart failure, but they have a preserved ejection fraction. This is uh, a disease where um, the prognosis is not good, but it's very much dependent on the DLCO. So this is a low DLCO. They are nearly all dead after five years, and the survival is quite good in those ones with a better DLCO. And we know the DLCO uh, is associated with the male sex, smoking history, and this poor uh, survival. And we, we must think in systems. So there is something where things are associated to each other. It's the male gender, it's the old age, it's the smoking history, and probably this all causes endothelial dysfunction, and this may then be the reason for the low DLCO. In idiopathic uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, there are patients who have normal or near normal DLCO, but there are also patients who have a reduced DLCO. So that's not the PVOD disease, it's idiopathic PAH with low DLCO, so that's also possible. And if those ones with a good DLCO or better DLCO are compared with those ones with a low DLCO, the survival is much different between the two groups. This was published by a, uh, in Amsterdam by the group in 2000. 13. And again, this was associated with old age, smoking, male sex, coronary heart disease, and minimal changes in the uh, HRCT. So it's a pattern. That's a pattern which is associated with a poor survival. 
When we look on patients with scleroderma, we know that the vascular involvement is the most important factor for the survival of the patients. And here you can uh, um, um, compare those ones who have pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is the most important outcome of this vessel involvement of the patients with those ones who have not developed the pulmonary hypertension. And as you see, over 10 to 15 years, these patients decrease with their DLCO, and this predicts that the vessels are involved and the vessels are attacked by the disease. It even predicts that the pulmonary artery pressure goes up, even if it's just slightly uh, to go above 20, milli uh, above 20 millimeters of mercury. This was also shown in scleroderma patients. And next. Okay. We have uh, done a study in our own uh, cohort in Graz where we had 614 patients who all received a right heart catheter investigation and a DLCO. And um, we were interested in the question how these two factors, pulmonary pressure increase and low DLCO, combine in their importance for the prognosis of the patients. And what you see is that this is the survival curve of the patients who have a good DLCO and a low pulmonary artery pressure. It's good. Those ones who have either a low DLCO or a high pulmonary artery pressure are these ones. So they are significantly worse in the survival, but not so much. However, those ones who have a low DLCO and a high pulmonary artery pressure, they have very poor survival. So this is something where, um, uh, which, which should have therapeutic consequences. So I, I said we have to think of it in terms of a system, and we try to, to think of that system. We have um, uh, published a study where we um, thought of the concepts how disease um, occurs in COPD patients. We have both endothelial dysfunction damage, we have epithelial dysfunction damage, and this, uh, after all, uh, results then in pulmonary artery pressure elevation. And the important point to make is, it seems that the DLCO may be a global marker of factors associated with a poor prognosis because it's associated with all these factors within the vicious circles we have. I have um, a special scheme for the DLCO. It's a little more complicated than the one you just saw by Professor Magnussen. It shows that uh, there are uh, many parts of the lung, arsini, there are many vessels in the lung. There's a very large surface area where the diffusion can take place. And this may be changed, for example, by age. So the surface area shrinks, becomes smaller. Uh, we have less alveoli. We have the same number of arsini. So um, this um, may occur with hypertension, uh, left heart disease, and um, this is associated with smoking, inactivity, western diet, aging, causing endothelial dysfunction, and then, and then again, the left heart failure. So it's a vicious circle which we see here. The next is that we have, um, uh, in some patients, a loss of arsini. So if they have severe emphysema, it looks like that. And uh, here we have more risk for pulmonary hypertension. And if we have patients where the, the uh, whole lung shrinks together and is glued together, then we, of course, have less DLCO. We have a structural loss of alveoli. We have a high risk for pulmonary hypertension, but it can be even worse. We can have patients who, in addition, have emphysema, and they have very, very bad DLCO and a very bad um, prognosis, and we have a very strong association with pulmonary hypertension. And, as I said, the vessels can be affected. If it's uh, primarily the pulmonary veins, we have the PVOD, 
which causes severe pulmonary hypertension, but we can also have a combination with the arteries, and this always causes severe pulmonary hypertension. I come to the conclusion. The DLCO may present a global marker of structural and functional decrease of the gas exchange surface of the lung, and it, it's associated with aging, interstitial lung disease, and emphysema, pulmonary pressure elevation, and vascular remodeling, and that's very important with mortality. Thank you very much.